I don't, it doesn't show. We can talk to each other maybe. I was just saying, hi, Wendy. <laughs> hi, Dave, how are you? Okay. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hi, Rich and Gary. You, well, Gary's not muted, but oh, now Rich is unmuted. Yeah. Jay had told us earlier that we, if we speak the whole, everybody there hears us. Oh. <laughs> That's good dark ink. Is Wendy or what? Dory, Dory. <laughs> She'll always be Wendy to me. Oh, because she worked there. Yeah. <laughs> On you. I'm always waiting for the, then I want to share my screen. There we go. If we got it well. We thought everyone would get up and go for snacks, and you haven't. So here we go. Um, do the screen share. Here, pause, and then it should be going. So let's see. So here. We got it now. Good. I think I have. I'm sharing there, but I'm not sharing here. Give me one second. So get this program. Um, so sorry. Let's see. Looks like 
this one back in, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So ready to go here. Now you find your mouse. There we go. I'm just wondering if I should be sweating profusely about now. <laughs> People must be looking. And am I muted and I'm set to go? Should be good. All right, let's see what happens. Hi, can everyone see the screen? Can you hear me? I know I should have checked this a little bit before. Wonderful. So one of the key purposes of these events is just to have a pleasant evening and pleasant day together. And I didn't want to be the butt of jokes, but I guess I will. <laughs> you kind of want to have fun, but you don't want to be the comic. All right, let's get going. Thank you for your um, coming out this evening. And then coming tomorrow, we call this workshop the Healthy Congregations Workshop. We'll go into it uh, in detail um, as we have it. We've got the manuals there that um, we'll work through in the course of tonight and tomorrow. I'll just say a little bit about this workshop. It was uh, originally developed by uh, uh, a Lutheran pastor named Peter Steinke. Peter passed away two years ago during the COVID which was sad. He developed this in the 90s, and some of the stuff will feel very 90s-ish. We'll apologize for that, but you'll quickly recognize, boy, that's dated, and that, that is right. I took training with Peter in 2004 for the workshop, and I've done a lot of these, and have done a lot of other things. I'll say a little bit more about that, but I do want to identify Peter Steinke, and he's got a number of books, including um, Healthy Congregations, and he talks about it. We'll think about that a little bit. So I'm from the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center. I came here, I don't know, three, four, five, six weeks ago, one Sunday morning. Uh, some of you might have been here. Um, I flew in on the Saturday night and had to go out and get a car. I didn't know that it would be in the middle of a snowstorm. And I stupidly did not, I was driving and couldn't write down when they told me which slot my car was in. Well, I thought it was A26, and I remembered it's a Nissan Rogue, and I thought, oh, I can find it. But when I arrived in Allentown, everything was iced over. I thought, oh, I'm not sure if that's a Nissan. So I had to go down the road. It should be nice off the front of the car. I thought, oh, that's not a Nissan. You know, that's both wagons. Go to the next one. I had this coat on, nothing else. But anyway, it was great to be here that Sunday morning. It's, it's, it's a little better than that day, I can say that. Anyway, um, so I'm from the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center. I'll say a little bit about it, but this is our kind of the verse that, um, what would you say, sort of our mission verse or something that says, you know, Second Corinthians, we're called to be ambassadors for Christ and God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. So that's kind of the framework from which we come. I'll just briefly say a little bit about the Lombard and I piece and then I'll say a little bit about uh, myself in, the, in that context. So the, the Peace Center started in 1983 and I'm sure it started in a Mennonite church basement in Lombard, Illinois. And it was being a resource for um, different Sunday school materials kind of loaning out videos. So it was collecting videos and loaning them out as a resource. And if, if you remember 1983, I'm, I don't know the genesis exactly, but during the Reagan administration, Reagan was going to rebuild the military. I know I was in Germany at the time. They were talking about putting Pershing II missiles in Europe. And that kind of came up for the Mennonites. That was a big issue. And so I'm sure some of the genesis came out of that originally uh, in that way. Um, it moved away from being a resource center to people said, you know, we're having some fun, like 
can you come in and begin to do more mediation work and then training in uh, 1998, it became officially registered as an independent 501c3, um, but it still reports as a faith-based entity to um, the Illinois Mennonite Conference. We don't have Presbyterian you know, conferences um, in that way. Um, I'll say just a little bit about me. My name was up there previously. Uh, my name is Jay. Um, I'm ordained minister, but I'm ordained through uh, brethren. You don't have a lot of Dunkirk brethren, old order German Dunkirk brethren up in this area, but down in Germantown and Philly and Lancaster in that way, and then Western um, uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, Elizabethtown, Junietta, those would be old brethren colleges. That's kind of my background. I've done a lot of work with Mennonites, mainly overseas. And have a graduate degree in, from a Mennonite institution. But if you had Mennonite, they would look at the name and say, well, that's not a Mennonite name. And it's not that I'm not Mennonite. So I don't want to say that. I just want to anchor it. So we don't do much uh, with that. But that's my name. I am a minister. So I'll say a little bit about what we're going to do tonight and then tomorrow as well. So we're going to begin to think about systems thinking. I'll have a little devotion. And tonight we're just going to see two videos. One is called An Anxious Congregation, and the second one is called A Responsible Congregation. Each of those is just about 13 minutes, and then we'll have some uh, conversation around our tables together and uh, get folks talking. Um, and we'll do that. And we'll, I'll give a little context and some background, but that's where we'll spend most of our evening. Um, today, so I'll introduce it, and then we'll move into that. Um, tomorrow we'll begin, I think we're beginning, I didn't change that exactly, I have session two, but we'll start talking about this concept of anxiety, chronic anxiety, how anxiety impacts us, and how it impacts our behavior in a way, and then this concept of differentiation itself, I'll talk a bit about that and explain it. It's an important term for this workshop, and you'll really understand it by uh, tomorrow as we get into it. Then um, we'll have a break in the morning. Again, I, I've got that slide slightly long, um, but second session, this idea of healthy congregations focusing on strength and how to manage conflict. Um, so we'll really think about those two ideas uh, in a way. And then, um, Later in the afternoon, we're going to do, uh, we'll, we'll spend it a little more in planning and, and, and discussion together, but this concept of um, challenging one another, focus on mission, promoting strength through our own presence and functioning, to be available, to be present, to be engaged, to be thoughtful, to be active, um, and the significance of being available and, and present and how that can really move a church forward in a way and then again as i said some planning up there so some of the purposes we hope to achieve in it um, really of course we're just trying to advance the mission of the church strengthen the whole body of christ if you will but also this idea to equip church members particularly leaders in understanding that they're responsible for the health of the church just like in a family, it doesn't matter who you are, you're responsible for the health of the family, certainly as parents, but even grandparents. You know, when you bring people together and sending out birthday cards and asking, you know, going out to the grandson's soccer game, all those are really helpful to keeping the family connected and healthy and strong. So we'll begin to think about our role in the church along those lines. So. We'll spend a lot of time talking about systems thinking. That may be a new concept for you. Um, maybe that term, the concept is not new. You'll understand it as we get into it, how it applies. And then finally, to be good observers of kind of the emotional process within family and the church and understanding what that means. And then finally, um, with this, this idea of being well differentiated in the midst of the church community, self-differentiated, well-differentiated, how to have a, a real voice and a real presence 
kind of step apart a little bit, be yourself, uh, come in the liberty of Christ, if you will. And we'll go through that. And then to help leaders see problems as opportunities for a healthy response. That sometimes families go through challenges, but there are opportunities to come together and, and grow and move forward. And then to challenge us to focus on our own selves, not you know moving beyond blame, focusing on others, but to really think about how we're behaving and functioning in the midst of it. And finally, as I said, to do a little bit more planning uh, mid-afternoon as we get into it. So I'm gonna start reading. Sorry for some of you, if it's awkward to see, I read the slides, so there's probably not a lot to see, but I, I feel like you're turning around at the top. Can you see all right the way we got it set up? You can hear all right. Let me go through it. This comes from Ephesians 4. We often read this passage. We could go to Philippians 2. We could go to Colossians 3. There's a lot of passage where Paul begins to address the tensions within the local church community. All of Galatians, you know, we could read. But I, I really like Ephesians 4. And it kind of sets the tone for what we're talking about tonight and tomorrow. So Paul begins with this really important phrase. He says that, you know, as a prisoner in the Lord, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling uh, to which you have been called. And I, I think that's really important. You know, you came in through Chicago O'Hare today and you see all the flight attendants and you see all the pilots and they have their uniforms on, right? They have their hats and they're very dignified. You wouldn't expect the pilot to be behaving the same way as some of the people complaining about their baggage or the mask or whatever in the church or in, in the plane, right? You would expect the pilot to live in a very different way. It'd be like in a high school at some point if the principal came to you and said, you know, you're a teacher, you're not one of the students. Don't you think you should start acting like a teacher, you know, getting caught up in all the teenage stuff? You no, know, you're a teacher. And Paul sort of has that sense here. I don't know what analogy works for you. But you have a high calling in Christ, and he's saying, you're not living up to that high calling. You're acting like you're just, you know, a teenager, or, you know, you're acting like you're, you're just one of the passengers on the plane. So remember to the calling you, you receive, live accordingly. And then he says these three really important words, with all humility, gentleness, and patience, bear with one another. And you could do that search, humility, patience. And you could go to any of the, the officials and find the same calling. More humility, more patience, bearing with one another in love. And that's part of our high calling. Um, in other parts of the world, you know, if you're in a corporation, you, you don't like people, you can just leave, quit, maybe go find another job. In a family, you can't quite leave your family in the same way you sort of stuck with them in a way. Um, but in the church, there's sort of a balance. But, you know, and, and Paul saying, learn to live with one another. Learn to respect one another. Learn to be kind to one another, right? Um, bear with one another in love. I, I think it's just such a great word for, you know, coming out of the pandemic. Feels like Americans are edgy. I don't know, maybe Midwesterners are edgy. I don't know about the Huggies if you're that way, but we're kind of edgy these days. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He goes on then. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in all. And this notion of one body, we often think of ourselves as separate entities. But he said, think of yourself as being part of a body. You're kind of part of that team, just like you're part of a family. You're part of a church. You interact that God's gifts and calling are different for people within the church. Not everyone has all the gifts. And so to have a whole functioning body, you need to regard yourself as dependent upon one another in that way. And that he's given one spirit to it. And he says, each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, therefore it said, when he ascended on high, 
to make captivity itself a captive and he gave gifts to his people. And of course the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. And it's not highlighted here, but the work of, of being a peacemaker within the church, right? Someone who can really listen, someone who can be present. I know in your family, you probably have some of the hotheads and you think, oh man, please don't say something to Uncle John over Thanksgiving. He'll just explode, you know, you have those. But you have others where there's problems or tensions and you'll say, you know, can I just talk to you a minute? And they're present, they'll listen. Almost every family has that, every church has that. I think it's a real gift, the gift of listening, being present, kind of understanding, um, setting aside judgment, being a little more patient. I think it's a real gift. Of course, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That gift is not highlighted here, but we think of it as a really important gift within the church. And you would recognize in this church some, some of those who really have uh, some of these gifts, uh, if you will. And he goes on until we come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to maturity. And I just love that word, maturity. Um, I have a daughter at home. She's 17. I have four kids. I'll show them a little bit. But those 17 year olds, you know, just once they get to be out of college, 24, 25, they function pretty differently. But when they're 15 and 16, they're caught up. Anything you buy them, like clothing that's inappropriate, it won't work. Oh, mama, hate it. You know, whatever you do, but they're constantly getting sucked in to these teenage squabbles. Who got invited here? Who didn't get invited here? Who said what? Who said right? You get caught in all of that. And Paul says, you've got to come to maturity. And we know what that means. We know what the immature behaviors, and we know what it's like to, to just be a little immature, more immature than we should be. That's why he says, you know, I call you to live to this life in this high calling in Christ, but the full measure of Christ. And he kind of carries this theme a little bit further. He says, we must no longer be children. The NRSV um, says we must, must no longer be infants, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. An example I give, my health is not great. I eat just garbage food, you know, and then I'll diet and I'll try this diet and I'll do it for a while and I'll try that diet. But just like a normal, healthy lifestyle, regular exercise, good eating, good sleep, et cetera. I don't, I'm sort of half joking. I don't live in that world. But then well, I'll try this diet for a while and then I'll get, you know, I'll get heavy and then I'll lose weight, I'll gain, you know, but I'm bouncing back and forth. Because in my mind, I haven't settled on a lifestyle. What's a good, healthy lifestyle for me? I just don't do it. Oh, if something comes up, oh, intermittent fasting, I'll try that for a while. Oh, keto, I'll try that low carb for a while. Oh, breakthrough, I'll try that for a while. Or I'll eat super spicy food, or I'll be vegetarian. Or, you know, you bounce around. Because in my own mind, I'm not anchored in my own thoughts. Right? That's what Paul is getting at here. You're being persuaded, and it's a sign of immaturity. If you have those teenage kids, they're jumping back and forth all the time because they're not firm in their convictions, their values, their principles. They don't know what they believe. And so they get sucked into this stuff. So Paul is saying a sign of maturity is you know what you believe, what you think. And that's going to be really important as we go through today. So deceitful, scheming, trickery, they get sucked in. At this point, speak the truth in love, two important concepts. Some families, there's a lot of love. Patience, forbearance, a lot of love. But boy, they would never bring up any issue that might be contentious. They'll just avoid anything along time like whatsoever, and no one will speak up. So kind of a a peace and a grief family. I don't know if you have any of those families. Other families, they'll speak the truth, but boy, it's, it's, it's angry, it's dogmatic, it's reactive. 
they'll just blast you. And you'll see it in churches, right? That prophetic voice, righteous indignation, right? Moral, judgmental, that's wrong. But they do it in such a way that it doesn't restore or strengthen relationships. Relationships get severed. It comes with something bitter and harsh to it. And Paul says, don't be that way. You know, sweep it under the rug, ignore it. We have differences, but if we all tend to smile and pray about it, everything will be fine. He, he, that's not Paul either. He's saying, you speak the truth, but you do it in a loving and kind way that deepens relationship, builds up the body of Christ. So that little phrase, there's sort of two errors you can make. One, when people just speak up, they just can't do it. They're like teddy bears. They just can't do it. Others can speak up right away and kind of let you have it, but um, that's that that often is hard on other people. So, and then he goes on, of course, every ligament with which it is equipped, each part working properly together, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. And again, that sense of we're all connected together. So these are some of the things. All right. I'm going to give you just a few minutes. You've had some time at your table, but I want you to kind of introduce yourself if you haven't. We're not going to take the time for everyone. I'm hoping we can get some folks in breakout rooms on Zoom for this. I'll just give you about five minutes to, it looks like a lot of you know each other. It take about five minutes just to say hello. And I want you to do this as an icebreaker. What really makes for an unhealthy family? An unhealthy family. Like if you think this family does that, you're gonna go, well, that's not healthy. So anyway, just take a few seconds, go around. I, I'll get a drink of water and then we'll come back. So take about five minutes if you want to grab a snack before we get into it. But if you don't start talking now, we won't have you talking late. What makes for an unhealthy family? Uh, yeah. What about you guys? Uh, not all racist are, but Eat bread. What? What about you? You get you got the, the matriarch, patriarch, whatever the dictator determinant. For me, it's the older sister. <laughs> How about here? Anything to add? You see in most of the same things, and you also have stuff that was mentioned when there's when you see uh, fighting among the leadership instead of caring for the down. Yeah, if the parents are fighting, it's interesting to see where the kids go. Sometimes we'll throw it out. You, you put two chairs together, husband and wife fighting, and then you have a couch, you have a bedroom, you have other things, and you have people. As your parents were fighting, where did you go? Where would you place yourself? I had an older brother, he'd be right between my mom and dad. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, we're beginning to think about these things. That's very helpful. And um, all right, let me. So you're going to have to gonna close that. Let's move. There, he had to do something. <laughs> you may have to mute them, Stephen. Thanks. I lost my controls here um, a little bit. All right, this is my family. Um, you can't see it, but this is taken up so long ago. Uh, I'm the one on the right. Um, I'm taller than my wife, she's in the middle, but I'm not as tall as my oldest daughter on the far left. She was a, a rower for Iowa, she's about 24. My, son is at Illinois, and then I have the two other daughters. We call them the little girls, so they're a little bigger. One's in college, and one is in high school. I just show that 
family because when you see the picture, it kind of looks like just the family unit, but that's the whole family, meaning there are no grandparents and there are no grandchildren in that family. Actually, I have, my father-in-law is still alive, but that's the whole family. And that says something about the family in a way as well. I want to show you this family. And as I talk through it, these are relatives of mine. I took this photo. This is Emily. This is Emily's mother. This is Emily's grandmother. This is Emily's great grandmother. And this is Emily's great great grandmother. The great great grandmother is my mother's younger sister, my Aunt Carol. The, the great grandmother is my cousin Leanne. We grew up together. I was actually good friends with her brother, who was a couple of years younger. And I, I can't even tell you how many nights I spent at their house growing up. So these are my cousins, and these are my family. You look at this, we didn't, we don't have the children, we don't have the husband in it. But boy, that family is different than my family. But my mother had five siblings, three sisters and two brothers. And it, my life was completely different than this one. So I put the dates when they were kind of born in there. I think I have the dates slightly wrong uh, in it. But basically my cousin Leanne got pregnant when she was 15 and married at 16. And then that happened with the next set, her daughter Autumn, and then the next set, and the next set, now Emily's coming up. How many college degrees do you think are in that family? No college degrees. Yeah, none left town, all in a very small town in you know, central Illinois. And my cousin Leanne got married at 16. Her husband was sitting right next to me when I took the photo 45 years. A photo. Just to say how different families are, my family, heart attack, cancer, right? Grandparents are gone, kids go to college, they're not married yet, so no children. And this family, no cancer, no heart attack, and they, they're right, friendly, and so their Thanksgiving and my Thanksgiving or their Easter and my Easter, completely different, right? And each of you could think about your family and think about your siblings and how they're just somehow different in a way. This is kind of an extreme example, five generations. But we're trying to step back and think about how these things happen and then to apply it to the church and think about how churches are different and how it relates to the church. That's kind of where we're moving with this. But I really like my aunt and my cousins if I ever if I said something negative about them in a way and presented them wrong way, I didn't be, I could say a lot more about that. All right, so we're going to move and start talking about families and we're going to start talking about systems thinking and then get to our videos. I won't spend much time on these introductions. So systems thinking, it's a, a shift from looking at individual parts to kind of look at the unit as a whole. Why was education so important to my mother and my father, but not to my aunt? It clearly came from my father's side, not my mother's side. All kids had to be educated. That was, that, my mother was a Blake. None of the Blakes were educated that way. But to begin to think about that shift. So uh, I'm going to highlight this individual. This is an individual named Murray Bowen. He was a psychiatrist with the National Institute of Mental Health, but he was a, a, from Tennessee, he was a medical doctor, uh, World War II, he was in Europe. And he thought, man, if I'm really gonna help people, I have to move beyond surgery and probably get into psychiatry. So he moves into psychiatry in the late 40s, early 50s. He was at a Menninger Institute out in Kansas, Carl Menninger started it. Um, and there it was a psychoanalytical sort of a Freudian approach uh, to family therapy. And with the sense that you would look at the relationship between 
the child and typically the parent with the relationship with the child and the parent, what they call the dyad. And as, as Bowen looked at it, he said, boy, I'm seeing a lot more than just the mother-child. You know, that father and the relationship between the mother and father and how they treat that child is a lot. He wanted to say, let me bring in the whole family to do research. And, and the Institute said no. So he went to Georgetown University and the National Institute of Mental Health and then started a clinic and could bring in the whole family and then look at them over an extended period of time and said, I'm seeing something far more than just the relationship between one or two. I'm seeing the unit functioning in certain ways and that's important. So he often would say this in an odd way that one person responds to another who responds to another who responds to the first who's already responded to the response of others. When my daughter, my wife grew up in a very conservative Christian reform church, CRC, Dutch, Grand Rapids, all that, Van Bruggen, that whole side and everything. And she was very conservative and she wanted to raise her children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, right? Good Christian mom and it was important that she was going to be a good wife. And then, you know, her parents were expecting to be Barbara, right? And so my daughter, who was born almost the Burmese border, we were working in Bangladesh at the time she was born there. And um, grew up, we came back, went back. She was in the fall at the time. She was about five. And she got into this habit of lying to my wife. And my wife was, was so angry. The thought that her daughter at five years old could look her right in the eye and lie just horrified her. And what would her mother think? And what would her husband think? And the notion, if she could lie at five, what would she do at 15? So she was petrified. She's envisioning where this child is going already, right? She's going off the rails at this point, really intense about it. And we talked about it. I had studied some family system stuff a little bit. And I thought, man, my wife is coming with this intensity. And I said, Sarah, my wife, Sarah, I said, Sarah, maybe if we could tone it down a bit, not be so anxious about it, so intense, that maybe Allison is responding more to a you know, this wave of emotion and less about who we are. And so my wife really can calm down about it, goes into the bedroom, crayons all over the wall. Allison, did you write on the wall? And typically Allison would say, no, but she said, yes, mommy, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> but my wife had calmed down, Allison had calmed down, and then my wife realized she's responding to the intensity of my wife's intent that I'm a bad mother, I'm raising my daughter, where she's going to end up. All of this is coming to my daughter is like, oh my word. And then when my wife was on, then she said, well, let's put it on paper and we'll put it on the refrigerator. And that's how they resolved it and it was done. And we never had that issue again. This is what Bowen's getting at, the response. You know, even before you do something, they're going to respond in such and such a way. So you're thinking about their response and you're responding accordingly. That's kind of what he's getting at. But in the church world, this was brought in by a rabbi, Edwin Friedman. Um, most clergy would have studied Friedman, um, these two books, Generation to Generation and Failure of Nerve. And we'll bring some of that. And what Friedman was saying is that just as the church, just as there's dynamics in a family. Churches feel like families and they have a, a unique system as well. So um, I'll do a case study tomorrow, but I'll just highlight some of this thinking a little bit and we'll, we'll kind of go through it here briefly. So this is a, a, a church, it was a mediation. It was Methodist, so you don't have to worry. Methodist has a different set of problems than you would have. But it was down in Texas, it had some unique features to it. But so we get a call from the what they call their council president. And it's it's very common to get this sort of call. We have a, a terrible conflict. Um, we're at each other's throats. And then what do you think comes next? Our pastor is acting more like a CEO than a, a pastor. That pastor has to go, you know, causing all kinds of problems. 
the pasture is cold and distant, blows up at meetings, micromanages everything and made so many changes. It doesn't even feel like we're in the same church anymore. And finally, went so far as to fire the church secretary. Well, actually the church secretary ended up, um, it was retirement age, but that was the way uh, it was shaped to it. But when you hear the story, how, are, how is this president, how are others interpreting the situation going on in the church? How are they seeing the problem? What, poor leadership, and it's just one person, right? It's the pastor. What about the president? What about the others? Nothing about that, right? It's just one person. What else? How are they seeing it? Yeah, only what the pastor is doing, nothing else. As soon as we got into it, this phrase stood out. I'm the fifth pastor living in a parsonage that's eight years old. Does that begin to define a family structure or system? That says a lot, doesn't it? Okay, right? But they're blaming. So as you refer to patterns, past patterns, other issues, completely irrelevant. They're just focused on the here and now, per se, like my wife focused on the daughter and not others. So anyway, this is what Bowen calls this linear cause effects. A does B does C. You're looking at individual parts. Behavior is seen as unidirectional. You're looking at events in isolation and then patterns uh, go unobserved, patterns from the past. So Friedman puts together this model and this is the model of trying to step back and see the whole unit uh, together and to identify some of those patterns. And as we get into it, we'll go through it in detail in the morning, but we could see a, a mutually influenced pattern of distancing and reactivity. People say, well, that pastor is actually caring and warm. His critics are the hostile ones. They're hateful and unforgiving. Again, the fifth pastor to live in an eight-year-old parsonage. And there was this broad system of anxiety impacting the church. And we'll talk through those a little bit more. So the emotional system then just describing kind of these life forces, how we come together, function together, live together, et cetera, and driving uh, sort of the dance of life is the way Bowen uh, reflected on it. He said, Bowen always said, constantly we're counterbalancing two key components. And this will be important. The sense of individuality, wanting to be our own person, kind of grow up, have our own voice, have our own career, have our own hobbies and likes and personality and character, right? To feel, think, act for ourselves. So as children, you know, we're breastfed and we're dependent on parents and we're kind of moving away. We just, my 17 year old, oh my word, she wants to be independent. Anything that looks like parents doing stuff together, she, she just bristles at it. But on the other side, we also want to be together. So we want to be ourselves, but we also want to be in a group. And if we're not, we feel this deep sense of loneliness, sense of isolation, sense of loss. Like it doesn't feel natural to us to be kind of out by ourselves. And it varies at different times in different ways um, with it. So I used the, this picture of a hedgehog. I don't know if you know hedgehogs, if you had them, right? But I, I don't know anything about hedgehogs, but imagine them living underground and it's really cold in the winter. And so they just want to be together because it's so cold and to huddle up is so warm. But a hedgehog has quills, they're bristly, and the closer they get, the more prickly it gets. So some kind of feel the cold and they can endure it more. And they can glob right up. Others, like, they just bristle. They just don't like it. And so we're constantly figuring it out. My daughter's at college. She knew her roommate from church camp uh, before going to college. Oh, you're going to that college? Let's be roommates. So now at the end of the year, you know exactly what happened. They got in and they got so close and they went to class together and they went to every meal together and they got up together. 
and it just got to be a little too close, right? And next year, the one's going to go to a different college. My daughter will live alone. They'll be good friends, but this year's too much, right? And we're constantly in this motion. You'll see it in relationship with siblings and others in the field in church as well. All right. We're going to see the video now, and I think I'm ready. So each video is about 12 minutes or so, and we'll look at an anxious one, and then we'll show the video. And then what we'll do is give you about oh, 10, 15 minutes to talk about it in your group. What are you seeing in this video? What are the leaders doing? What are others doing? What are the key words, key concepts that you pick up? The one is called an anxious congregation, and they're really having trouble. Um, this will be in your book on uh, A3. Sorry, I jumped around. I usually have my page numbers on my screen, but I haven't done very well in this presentation. So the first question, how would you define the problem? Who could have functioned differently? And then we'll see the second video and we'll, we'll again go to breakout rooms and compare and contrast them. And then when we're done doing both, we'll sort of, if you want to take notes on a piece of paper and put anxious and responsible, you can do that. So, um, Lord willing, everything will work. This is terrible. This is supposed to be a church, not a nightclub. Make a joyful noise to God. Finally, they've done something I like. Make a joyful noise to God. Coming to that service is going to mean just a lot less people coming to the regular service. Wasn't that great? It's good to see all of you here today. We're experimenting to see whether a contemporary service will attract new members or even people who don't find much meaning in traditional forms of worship. We're not replacing our Sunday worship. We're simply adding a worship service put to a contemporary setting. Right. I don't find it at all appealing, but I know the pastor's been pushing for it ever since he came here. I think he's got the leaders of the church fooled. Believe me, he's got the charm to get what he wants. It began as a congregation's vision. They wanted to reach out to the community with a worship service that was contemporary and appealing. But what was well-intentioned went astray. What was designed to help the congregation grow became the focus of its current distress. So what happened? I've been trying to figure it out, and I can't. I did it right by the book. I brought up the idea at a worship committee meeting and got their approval. Then I took it to the governing body and got their approval. We made it a part of our vision for the future. Finally, when we actually get the service going, all I began to hear was negative comments. I don't know whether it's me they're reacting to or finally introducing something contemporary in the, uh, what, the inertia that's been here for years. I don't know. You thought they were in agreement on this, and now you feel as though they've gone back on their word, pulled back from their commitment? It's almost like a betrayal. Well, it's a little bit strong, but we're now against each other instead of being together. There's tension, and I find it so hard to talk to the volatile critics. I don't know what to make of it. In talking with the pastor, he indicated his distress. The worship committee approved the contemporary service. The leaders included in their vision plans. Yet it's had such a negative reaction. Can you explain what's happened? Well, a committee isn't the same as a whole congregation, you know. Yes, we gave him permission to try out a contemporary service, but we had no idea how it was going to be received which means you're not feeling very good about your decision? 
Well, I'm not the kind of person who likes tension. Uh, in fact, my wife um, reminded me about what we went through when we built the addition onto our church building. People voted for it, but some of them left because they didn't think we needed the extra space. Like now, a lot of people didn't like what was going on. A lot of people? Well, enough people. I'm beginning to worry whether we did the right thing or not. Well, I don't like what's going on. I've talked to the Millers and the Thompsons and some of the others. Well, they're talking about leaving with all this going on. I know that as a committee we gave permission to the pastor to go ahead with this contemporary worship thing, but there's been a lot more negative reaction to it than any of us ever anticipated. The fact is, uh, this whole thing is getting out of hand. Look, if they're going to get this upset about something so minor, then who needs them? I say let them go. They've been members here longer than you have. Why, they have a right to say how they feel. Fine, let them say it and then leave it at that. But as soon as they start threatening to quit just because they're not getting their own way, well, that's just wrong. Well, if you appreciated them more for what they've done for this church, if you didn't always fall all over the pastor, well, maybe I we'd all be better off all too. I'm hey, hey, to... let's not start getting personal about all this. Our job is to find a way to make everybody happy without offending or losing anyone. I'm certainly willing to listen to any suggestions. I think we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Why don't we just ignore it? I think this will all blow over pretty soon. Oh, no, it won't. I tell you what we've got to do is we've got to go to Pastor Stetson and have him talk to Pastor Johnson. After all, he's retired, but Pastor Stetson still knows what's best for this congregation. Yes, he does. I don't know. That sounds pretty divisive. Why don't we all just go right to the pastor with our concerns? You, you really think he's going to back down once he gets something new like this started? No, I, I tell you, we've got to go to Pastor Stetson. He's the best one to talk to him. Will you people please make up your minds? First you give Pastor permission to conduct this new service, and then as soon as there's a complaint, you want him to stop. Are we going to support him or not? That's not the problem. The thing we've got to address here is how we keep this from destroying a church that we all love. We've got to do something or else it will tear the church apart. Your discussion ended with you making a plea to everyone to work toward a workable solution. Did you find one? Not yet. I'm afraid it's come to the point where I can't handle it. As far as I can see, the pastor is going to have to deal with it as best he can. After all, he started it in the first place. There's quite a turmoil in the congregation, and I understand you're in touch with what's going on. How did you become central to the whole thing? Well, I'm past president of the church, and people know me and trust me. They know they can talk to me. And what do they talk about? Well, they're upset. They don't like what's going on. Now, I don't feel one way or the other about Pastor Johnson, but I do know that he's forcing change down people's throats. Well, frankly, I don't like that, and a lot of others don't either. And so people are turning to you for leadership? That's right. I'm going to get to the bottom of this and get something done. I know a lot of important people that will throw their weight behind me. Well, it, it's becoming pretty clear that the reason the pastor has started this whole thing is that he would like to have more young people and families in the church. And they're saying that he really doesn't care for us older people at all. The worship service is out of hand. Well, some of us don't like what's going on. This was your church for 21 years, and everyone knows you and trusts you. You've got to go to Pastor Johnson and talk some sense into him. We need to decide what we're going to do about this. We're going to get together over at Jane's house later but we don't want anybody else to know about it, so if you could kind of keep it under your hat, that would be great. It feels like they're going to make us do it their way. Old people just can't seem to deal with anything different. I was at that committee meeting, and I asked them why they gave Pastor permission to do it in the first place. And the sneaky part, the part that made me so mad, was that they said, oh, we never gave him permission to do it at all. He just went ahead and did it on his own. Sounds to me that things are spiraling and getting out of hand. Oh, that's right. We're getting more and more divided. The problem is there's no real leadership. Well, that's where I come in. I've got to be more assertive. The church must be saved, 
And what do you mean by say? Well, there's got to be a firm decision. You're a hard man to find. You gotta work off your tensions. When I'm uptight, I work out a lot. That helps me. I'm a peace agree type. You know, keep it cool. This church is making a nervous wreck out of me. Well, leadership isn't easy. <laughs> Boy, you got that right. There's no one in the world who wishes someone else had this job more than I do. Well, why do you say that? These people are my friends. I live with them, work with them, play with them, worship with them, have all my life. They're not bad people. They just don't agree on everything. I can't go to them and tell them not to feel what they're feeling. What's wrong with just letting everything go back to the way it was? That's what I'm saying. I'm not going to sit around and let this fighting go on. I'm going to see to it that there's some resolution. A bunch of us have gotten together and we're going to demand that the congregation meet and put an end to this. Well, that's what she asked me. I assured her that I would be here to help put the pieces together again. These are really good people. It's a shame, and we need to pray that they do the right thing. I went along with the prayer part. Prayer is wonderful. But when he said that the pastor is against older people, well, that's not true. Like he didn't agree with that. And as far as I'm concerned, he is really against us older ones. And you know what else? What really makes me mad is that he spends all his time on this crazy worship service when he should be doing what he's supposed to be doing. He needs to be out raising money. I'm telling you, if they call a congregational meeting, or if they try to let that retired pastor of theirs take over, or if they try to stop that worship service, well, Merle and I have a whole lot of talking to do. I mean, we're not going to put up with a bunch of inflexible, selfish people who just, oh, I don't know. I am just so upset about this. This is all so sad. All they would have had to do is call him up and explain, and none of this would have happened. How vicious. I'm the target of everything. Everybody blames me like it's all my fault. Well, they want to play tough. I'll play tough. What if it just doesn't go away? What if it grows into something that finally tears the church apart? I don't think it will. We're all people of faith here, and if we have enough faith and, and pray about it, it will work itself out. You'll see. Pastor, perhaps you can explain what's going on. Your people showed up at the contemporary morning service. The tension at the late service was noticeable, and there's a general sense of unease. The turmoil that has been building with a few people is now affecting a much larger group of people. People are choosing sides, and others are boycotting things they don't agree with and the leadership of the congregation has been very slow to act. Well, what now? How does this get resolved? I don't think there can be any resolution. From the way I see it, either I have to leave or the unhappy people have to leave, which is unlikely, or we have to stop the contemporary service, which will make another group of people unhappy, those who want to reach out and bring other people in. Well, what about you? What are you going to do? I don't know. I'm tired and I'm frustrated. How could it go this far? How could it get so intense? How the situation is going to end is unclear. One thing that is clear is what began as a relatively small issue has widened into an issue that threatens to undercut the vision and stability of the congregation. I believe the pastor's questions are right on target. How could it get this far? How could it become so very intense? Did it have to happen this way? If you need a break, just to take it, but what, take about 10, 15 minutes in your group, just talking, what did you see in the video? What did it remind you of? Who could have done things? So go ahead and turn back, but do if you want to take a break, this is a good time to go ahead and do it. I know we've been pushing away from the next um, 
So this is called the responsible congregation. You're going to see a lot of things that look similar, but you're going to see some key things that are, that are different. So you're trying to see what's the difference in this one, how leadership manages itself differently. And yes, I do. It's hard to see my mouse from here. All right. I think we're ready. Here we go. Make a joyful noise to God. Let's worship God together now. This is terrible. This is supposed to be a church, not a nightclub. Make a joyful noise to God. Finally, they've done something I like. Make a joyful Coming to that service is going to mean just a lot less people coming to the regular service. Wasn't that great? It's good to see all of you here today. We're experimenting to see whether a contemporary service will attract new members or even people who don't find much meaning in traditional forms of worship. We're not replacing our Sunday worship. We're simply adding a worship service put to a contemporary setting. Right. I don't find it at all appealing, but I know the pastor's been pushing for it ever since he came here. I think he's got the leaders of the church fooled. Believe me, he's got the charm to get what he wants. It began as a congregation's vision to reach out to the community through a worship service that was contemporary and appealing. But what was designed to be a congregation's mission for some became a focal point of major dissatisfaction. This contemporary service that you've begun could be a risky venture. I've heard that in some congregations it's caused a great deal of tension. It isn't my contemporary service. The idea came out of a congregational planning meeting and I brought it to the worship committee for their approval. We carefully planned it, clearly communicated what we were about and what we were going to do. So you knew of the possibilities of it's causing tension? Oh, yes, I did. The committee also knew. We've all heard about resistance coming on the heels of change. We've been very intentional in the way we've implemented it. First, the planning committee, then the worship committee, then the congregation support. It's all part of our vision strategy, reaching out. Are you aware of the people that are being upset by this? Nobody's come to me directly. I've heard some rumors. In spite of the careful way that you've approached the contemporary worship, there's still some anxiety among some people. Care to comment about it? I know there's a group of people unhappy about it, but I don't know how many or to what degree they're upset. The pastor indicated that he had sought approval from the worship committee. Yes, we did give him the go-ahead, but this is not the pastor's service. The majority of the people wanted it. We want to be a congregation with a clear purpose, and reaching out to the community is one of our purposes. You had been hoping for total support even though you knew there might be some resistance. Exactly. That's when we went to plan B. What's your plan to deal with the opposition? We agreed that if people were upset, the committee would reconvene and listen to them. Perhaps we could learn something, and yet do it without caving into dissent. What happened? Well, I don't like what's going on. I've been talking to the Millers and the Thompsons, people like that, they're all talking about leaving if this keeps up. 
As a committee, we supported the idea of a contemporary service. There's been some negative reaction to it, a time we hoped wouldn't come, but thought that it might. And that's why we're here meeting to discuss it. Yes, but this negative reaction is big, bigger than I thought. We need to nip this worship thing in the bud. If we don't, people will start to leave. That's why this demands action and demands it now. I think we need to stay the course. I don't want to back off just because some people are upset. We need to go ahead with our plan, Jean. After all, you were in on that decision. Well, I went along with it, yes. But tell me, what's the value in losing good members just to get new members? Well, can't we get new members some other way? Well, the pastor could make more calls. We could have more social events. We could improve the youth program. We're a committee, not a debate team. Let's focus on the real concern, how to respond to the criticisms that we're hearing from certain people of the congregation. Just stop those worship services. That'll stop the criticism. Pastor Johnson needs to back down. If we do that, aren't we contributing to the undermining of our focus for the future? I believe there has to be a better way. The thing that worries me is that if we don't start doing something fairly soon, we're going to start losing members. And I'm talking about people who joined when Pastor Stetson was here. I think we should get Pastor Stetson to go and talk to Pastor Johnson about having these services less often. I don't think that's a good idea. Why should we pass our responsibility off to Pastor Stetson? We need to deal with this ourselves. Well, Pastor Stetson never messed anything up. He always had a more practical approach than Johnson has. I still think we need to get Stetson involved. I think the best way is the most direct and open way. What could be more open and direct than going straight to Pastor Johnson with our concerns? You know, it's possible that he doesn't even know that people are upset. You've got to be pretty dumb not to pick up on the criticism that's beginning to emerge. I mean, if Pastor Johnson is that dumb, all the more reason for Stetson to get involved. I think that we need to ask Pastor Johnson to come to the meeting, and the Millers, and the Thompsons, and anybody else who's interested. Well, you can count me out. Talk, talk, talk. I already told you what those people said. I've heard both of your concerns, and I, I still favor conversation with Pastor Johnson and anyone else who has a concern. When we started this, we knew that there would be a few risks involved. And if we become as anxious as the others, then we won't be effective leaders. We need to remember our goal and not get so caught up in our own worries. I'll arrange a meeting with Pastor Johnson, and I'll also talk to the president about a meeting with the Thompsons and the Millers and whoever else might be interested. Your meeting ended with your committee deciding to talk directly to the pastor. How did that meeting go with him? Well, I think it was successful. He knew that something was up, but he hadn't heard the criticism directly. He appreciated hearing our concerns and said that he welcomed the opportunity to speak directly with us. And what about the people who were upset? We're working on that. There's a bit of turmoil in the congregation, and I understand that you're in touch with a lot of what's happening. You're obviously worried about people's negative reaction to the new worship service. Well, as past president of the church, I'm more concerned about losing members than some of the others on the worship committee. But when I tried to sound the alarm, it was like they couldn't hear a thing I had to say. They're not taking you seriously? Well, everyone takes me seriously. At least they'd better. I'm saying that, um, what? Well, they didn't react in the way I thought they might. So you were hoping for more support for your position? Well, sometimes you've got to fight fire with fire. Using that analogy, doesn't that just add to the blaze? Well, it's certainly a lot better than trying all this negotiating stuff. At the meeting, you went to involve Pastor Stetson in the meeting. Did you ever meet with him? Yes, I did. And how did that go? Well, not exactly as I had expected it to. Pastor Stetson, you know how highly we valued your ministry all these years. We need you to help us to get us out of this contemporary worship mess. I hear some people are upset by it. Oh, 
upset's not a strong enough word. It's more like disgust. Why, Sam Schultz even called it the contemptible service. Well, that's how upset some people have gotten. Well, what do you think I should do about it? We want you to go to Pastor Johnson and talk some sense into him. Well, if he keeps this up, he'll split the congregation. I know that you mean well, Jeannie, and it's flattering that you still think so highly of me. It would only complicate matters if I were to get involved at this point, so I'm going to have to say no. I truly feel that the best thing that you could do is go directly to Pastor Johnson and share your concerns with him. I'd encourage you to ask the others that are feeling unhappy to do the same thing. He turned me down. I heard him affirm you and suggest another approach. You did? I heard him flat out reject me. You're a difficult man to find. I didn't know anyone was looking for me. Well, I'd like to get your reaction to this controversy surrounding the contemporary worship service. Frankly, I'm not surprised by what's happened. You're not? We've had problems before with changes that have taken place. Besides, we have people with strong opinions. What you can't forget, though, is that the vast majority of our people want this change. So you stand aside hoping it'll all go away? Not really. Please, don't mistake my calmness for disinterest. I don't like unpleasantness any more than other people do. It's just that I don't think a knee-jerk reaction is going to be helpful in the long run. And what will? Well, this confrontation isn't all bad. All churches have problems. It's what you do with those problems that counts. In this case, people are debating, discussing, dialoguing, all of which is good. Oh, there's some disagreement. There, there's some hurt feelings. But that, too, can be a sign of life. And so you think this can be productive? Oh, you bet. There's a lot of energy being expended out there, energy that's focused on the good of this church. Of course, there's some disagreement on exactly what that means, but out of that will come new ideas, new understandings, new changes. We've met challenges before. I know we have the ability to move on. I was so mad. If our committee was going to back down from its support of that worship service, I was really going to give it to them. But then Pastor Johnson came to the meeting and listened to our concerns, and we realized that we needed to support what was happening. Once he started talking, everyone stopped listening to me. <laughs> well, he's a smooth customer, and he really did a number on them. <laughs> I haven't given up yet. I've still got a few aces up my sleeve. I still don't like her, the way she always has to have everything revolving around her. If she had her way, we'd be at each other's throats. At least now we don't have to cave in every time she snarls at us. Yes, I have. I've talked with the Thompsons and the Millers and a few others. I'm not sure who will be there. Miller said that nobody would listen to him. I told the members of my group, please don't start a letter-writing campaign in support of the family service. We're handling the situation. No, I, I agree with you. I don't like losing members either, but I don't like anger, especially in church, I don't like anger. I mean, once you've made your point, then it's time to move on. What's the use of getting more and more angry? <laughs> I know you're my friends and all that, but I just can't do that. I, I, I... What was headed for a confrontation seems to have simmered down. Actually, it has. The contemporary worship service is going quite well in spite of some opposition. People have been open with me about their feelings. Oddly, the whole thing has helped us concentrate more clearly on our mission. Well, what about some people's opinion that you're not taking their criticism seriously? I've listened to the criticism, and I hope that I have responded to what's going on. I haven't always changed to meet their demands, or have I given in to some of the pressures that have arisen, but I have tried to listen to them, I've tried to be fair, and I think I can say the same thing of the worship committee. Well, I say you've both succeeded. One final question. You seem very hopeful. Is this a pretense, or do you really feel that way? I really do feel hopeful. 
you know, I understand that people are bothered by change and will react to whatever they see going on. It's part of the process for us to deal with them directly and to address their concerns. But they also have to be challenged by our mission and our vision. This congregation was able to face conflict and turn it into an opportunity to refocus on its mission. How did they do that? If they did it, can others do it? What might we learn from this situation that will help us in our interactions? These questions come to my mind and perhaps to yours. Okay, let's go back to the group. We'll take about 10 minutes. What was different this time? What were some uh, <laughs> what Um, please say your name. All right, I'm um, Millie Lewis. And anyway, the one thing that I noticed the uh, worship committee uh, held their ground. They stepped together. Um, they did what I meant, like they did in the beginning, the first um, video. They supported each other. Um, they went directly to the people who were struggling with what was going on. And the communication, I think, flow was, was good. Yeah. Yeah, with that, they even went so far as to say, you know, we have a plan B. And they implemented a plan B, which was really to stick to their ground in the midst of some of the reactivity that people were. Thanks, Nelly. That's great. Others? Yeah. The uh, chair of the worship committee, uh, there were two different people. The first time, he kind of threw up his hands. The second time, he really was acting in love where he tried to uh, elicit the you know, opinions of everyone, even those that may have disagreed with him. He made them feel that they were a part of the committee, which I thought was very important. Yeah, he was supporting everyone in the group and trying to listen to them each way. What do you mean by threw up his hands in that first place? He just didn't function as a chairperson. It's, it's on the pastor, right? He threw it on the pastor as quick as he could. This, it was his idea. Yes, we supported it, but you no, know, he was just captured, I think. Yeah, thank you. But was very supportive of the committee. The committee did its job. Others? Yeah, I'm Jeff Hill. Um, it was nice to see the former pastor the boundary and say this is not my battle. Knowing the boundaries staying in here and, and others have boundaries as well, but that the entire past. Well, these are good people I have to be there to support them. So he wasn't trying to be militia, right? He was just trying to pick up the pieces, you know, that overly helped pull a neighbor. Thanks. So the other part is that they encouraged the people that were complaining to actually go talk to the pastor in person. So there was a direct communication to make sure the pastor understood what their concerns were so he could more effectively deal with them. What did they do in the first video, right? What happened in that first video? In the first video, they just said, I heard from XYZ, and here's what they said. And why go ask them again? I already told you what they said. And the pastor didn't quite know even what was going on in the midst of it. Everybody assumed, well, he's pretty dense if he doesn't know what's going on. But they didn't actually take the time to do it. So direct communication and direct dialogue. And they would, were comfortable with the Ben, you want to jump in? No. <laughs> yes. They first they focused back on developing a strategy, a strategic plan, and then they tied the vision and the mission together to support that. And that's where the contemporary worship service came from. And they began to communicate that. Yeah. How did it feel in that first one? They talked a little bit about mission 
In fact, I noticed the difference between the two. Well, on that first one, I mean, they, they really didn't keep going back to it to touch stuff at all. Yeah. You, know, you just tossed it out the window. As a matter of fact, they tossed God out of the process. <laughs> yeah. That's all the purpose of worship. So. But we read in the devotion about being taught to and fro, and that sort of felt like this first congregation. Somebody says something, somebody does something, and they're just going back and forth. But the second one, there was a clear plan. It was long term, and and this worship was just probably one of numerous things that they were trying to do. They could stand by that. <laughs> I think they have their license. I don't think I can get my uh, screen back down. Uh, go ahead, Richard. You want to unmute and then jump in? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I just uh, made a note in the chat that said, I said in the first video leadership, meaning that group and the worship committee wanted to do things. And the quote was without offending or losing anyone. And in the second video that, uh, that, the, that group of leaders did not say that. Yeah, the, the, the number one concern was that people would leave, right? In that first video, that that was the driving force behind it. And in that first video, I think maybe the second video as well, they highlighted, you know, back along the way, we did a, was it a building project or we added a wing to the church and some members got half, got upset and left. So they kept referring to this pattern that there's tension in the church. And so some of the older members remember that, you know, this happened. My wife reminded me that when we, did it, I don't know if we have some trouble to what to do it at this point. But there were other things in the past of members just walking away and leaving. And that's triggering for some, like, oh no, we're going through this again. I think that's why Dean was so reactive. Richard, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jay, I like the difference in the two videos between the fellow that was shooting boots, the president of the country. In the, in the first video, it was more about conflict avoidance. Keep it cool or quiet. <laughs> and in the second one, he recognized and pointed out that conflict with plus dialogue is how Growth happens, how change happens. Um, and and I, I really like that. Yeah. Um, she even asked him, in the sense, are you hiding out in the basement? I said, get out. And he said, well, not really. You don't mistake my calmness for disinterest, something along those lines. Um, but in the first one, I, you know, I peace and agree, keep it cool. You know, he's avoiding. In the second one, even said, you know, there's a lot of conversation going on and it's really healthy. So, yeah, I guess his, his was the most pronounced difference. Others? Then we'll ask this question How is Jeannie the same or different in the two videos? Jeannie was the woman, the former president. Uh, everyone takes me seriously, or at least they better. She was the same in both videos. That was the important one of the important points that ultimately they kind of had to put a boundary around Jimmy a little bit. They had to deal with her, but she was not allowed to set the agenda in quite the same way. She was difficult. They loved her, cared for her in a positive way. They did have the kind of they didn't really shut her down. And I saw in the second one, she got some affirmation from the person. You know, it's not like, you know, you're out of here, forget it. 
You mean the retired pastor or which one? Uh -huh. Or in the worship committee? Uh, the, uh, yeah, right. And that, you know, I don't remember exactly how it went, but we, we know where it comes from. We appreciate the music, but you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, she had her time for input as well, but she didn't set the agenda exactly that well. The, the strategic plan. So that's kind of it. Anything else that we missed that you, you, your group pointed out? The communication, you know, we're, we're going to read it from notes, but we don't want anyone to know about it. So, you know, just be there. We may uh, notice that even though there was progress made, was there really a true resolution? And not necessarily, but movement, some movement toward it. And, and maybe a true resolution doesn't you know, happen that quickly, but it does. Yeah, we, we didn't see the full video, but clearly they had a long ways to go before they were going to resolve this issue. Um, it, it wasn't done yet. I mean, they were beginning to meet and beginning to talk, but there were still tensions around it for sure. They were coming back to the strategic plan and we planned this as a congregation and they were echoing those things, which I think would have been really helpful to move in that direction. But I agree, it wasn't resolved in this video. Good, good point. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to highlight that terminology, the plan B. We'll come back to that tomorrow because they they did assume that there would be there would be a difficult process for that. Online, if you didn't hear them to say that um, they highlighted the risk going into it. We knew there would be some risk, I think was the phrase, and that they had to kind of step back, move a little more slowly, have special listening sessions, talk to people, understand their concerns. And even the pastor said, you know, I've listened to them. I haven't always given in or agreed or something like that. A willingness to be I thought it was really interesting at some point. I think was talking to the president of the um, Mormon Church. I could be too, but it's hard to Yeah, thank you, Mary. I, I just think it was um, very positive when the president was talking to the interviewer that he couch conflict in a positive way because he said that energy within that conflict could be focused for the good. Yeah. Positive things were happening, good dialogue, interacting, moving the church forward. Yeah, there was energy around. But we'll bring you my the <laughs> The other thing I noticed was that in the worship committee, when he made the comment about bringing people in, he, he said something about, and we may learn something. So it wasn't just let's bring them in and we're set in our way and that's the end of it, but that there might be something to learn from the people who are upset. Yeah, I think that, that um, going in with kind of a, a, if you will, as a researcher, wearing the hat, just honestly trying to hear what they have to say, maybe there could be, as opposed to, we know we're right and you're wrong, but we've got to come, you know, come sh share your piece or come vent your anger, okay, um, and then move on. But they, it was an honest session. Okay, yeah, maybe we do have to adjust our focus a little bit accordingly. Um, they had a attitude about the Bible verse and how was the, the other one? How would you describe that attitude? Um, fearful. Fearful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, something hopeful about the about the hero. Fearful, kind of backbiting, criticizing, even had to come out and say, hey, hey, let's not get personal. Because it was personal. All right, we anything else? We kind of know where we're going with this, so that's great. Okay. So there's snacks. I don't know what it means, but we're going to move toward closure tonight, but I'm going to give you homework for tomorrow. Yeah. So in the back of your book, mine's falling apart. There's a yellow page called F1. And it's just a case study. We're going to spend some time and to look at this, this congregational life. So, and then there's a, a page F2 behind it. It'll be important for you to read that uh, before coming tomorrow, or if you don't read it, you know, I'll give you more time. I'm not stuck with that, but try to take some time to read that. It would be really helpful. Okay? And then let's move toward prayer and closure tonight. Any last comments? Anyone? Thank you all for Zoom. We tried our best. I don't know if we quite got it as well as we would have liked. Pastor, if you would make your announcements and then we'll move toward thanking the Lord for a good night. First, we want to thank the deacons. Can everybody give up? Thank you for Good night, everyone. I